Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for joining this Becoming a Doctor session. So this is an essential site for all F1 that it's hosted by uh, Tom Dalton. So just some ground rules for everyone watching. If you're watching on the, um, if you're watching on the Zoom, any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat box or the Q&A box. This is very informal, kind of more of a just chat kind of thing rather than like a hard line lecture. There are two questions which will pop up on your screen if you're on the Zoom as a poll. If you're on Facebook, they won't pop up on your screen, but still feel free to answer them for your own learning. Otherwise, I'm going to pass it off to Tom. All right. Cheers very much, Ishan. Um, yeah, my name's Tom Dalton. Uh, you may remember me from such Becoming a Doctor lectures as Madness, an introduction to psychosis. Uh, so this is essential psych for F1. Um, and basically, I'm just going to whiz through a few topics that are sort of come under the umbrella of psych that every doctor needs to know for F1. That's kind of the aim. Uh, and hopefully we'll finish a little bit before time and have some time for questions in general chat about uh, psych jobs or whatever. So all of this is basically aimed at the general medic on, on a general medical surgical ward. Um, just, yeah, some key bits of psych. Um, the slides are fairly light in terms of content uh, because I'm trying to, I'm aiming to, any of the stuff that I teach you should be minimal enough that you can actually remember it off the top of your head because that's it's the kind of stuff that you just need to have in your mind rather than stuff that you have time to look up. Um, where the slides are dense is just because I have not edited them and copied them from a previous presentation because I am A, super busy fighting corona, or B, just lazy, delete as appropriate. So, on we go. Um, disclaimer by the Becoming a Doctor team, uh, if I inevitably chat shit, it is my fault, not theirs. Um, so, the slide you've all been waiting for, learning objectives for today. We're going to talk a bit about self-harm and risk assessment because that's quite important. Um, only briefly, you'll be glad to know. Um, someone's shouted on the chat, I'll get that in a minute. Uh, psych emergencies. So, uh, and these are gonna be pretty pretty brief, just like the bare stuff that you need to know. Um, similarly with psychopharmacology, because I know in psych you have loads and loads of confusing drugs with very similar names. What do you actually really need to know on the ground uh, as an F1? And uh, just a very brief reminder of the Mental Health Act, Mental Capacity Act, just things you need to be most aware of. Um, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time right at the end on medically unexplained symptoms, um, because that is something the, I think we often don't receive much teaching on. And I'm not going to not going to go massive detail on the theory of it or anything. This is more how to approach it as a doctor. And actually, as an F1, you sometimes weirdly have more time to talk about some of those things than you might, I don't know, than your consultant or your reg do. So actually, it can be ideal. Uh, as I've, I've had a good um, chances to, to, to address the medically unexplained symptoms as an F1. So anyway, I'll spend a little bit more time on that than the other topics. Um, and then, yes, feel free to ask any questions as we go along or at the end. Um, and shout if you I don't know, have any problems or can't hear me or whatever. So risk assessment, traditionally quite a boring topic. Uh, so I'm just going to stick to the real basics and what, what do you kind of need to really be aware of? Um, because while, you know, boring, it's, it's just, you know, obviously quite key. So first slide on suicide, obviously. Um, this is a big old list of risk factors. And I, you know, these are things that you might have had to learn for, for finals, or sorry, might still have to learn for finals and if they haven't been cancelled. But um, the reason I list these is not so that if you're doing a, I don't know, A&E or a liaison psych job or whatever, you can see someone who's self-harmed and you can pick up on all these things and tick all the boxes and get loads of points when you present it to your consultant. It's more if you are seeing a patient who's not come in with self-harm, uh, who's in your GP surgery, for instance, or just on the ward. If you spot a pattern of all of these things, that's when it's really worth finding a bit of time to open the can of worms and just, you know, I don't know, chatting to them, asking how, I don't know, whatever, all of these various I don't know, recent bereavement, being in hospital with a terrible illness, whatever it might be, might have affected them. Oh, how's your mood? I don't know. Do you ever have, you know, and start asking questions about mental health and possibly about thoughts of harming themselves. Because very often it's the sort of thing someone won't talk about unless asked. Um, I don't really need to talk through this list of things because I think all of it's fairly common sense, to be honest. Obviously, I say that as someone who is a psychiatrist. So if it's not common sense to a med student, that's my bad. But um, yeah, I think just it's a case of being aware that if you see a lot of these things in one patient, be thinking, might this person might this person be at risk 
of self-harm or suicide. And it's really important. And it's picking the kind of picking it up early before they've come into hospital with self-harm. That's the real, you know, absolute win because you might have saved that person an awful lot of suffering. Um, so anyway, there we go. That's that. And lastly, uh, on assessment, so particularly for things when any, whether they're hopeless or they're future oriented, the weird opposite of hopelessness that apparently that's what it's called. Um, that's just an important thing to pick up when you're doing a mental state exam, really, um, as I'm sure you know. So I just highlighted that one. And then just to briefly look at doing a self-harm assessment. Again, it's a bit of a list of things, but um, the main point I want to make that I want you to remember is the easiest way to do an assessment. So if someone's coming to A&E, whatever, having self-harmed, how do you approach that? Well, the best thing is to try and think of the narrative, try and start at the beginning. I've got a happy storybook here to contrast with the content of what they're saying. Start at the beginning and just work through the details of what happened. And you can't really go too far wrong because you can try and remember this big scattergun list of, oh, predisposing factors and blah, uh, did they have alcohol? Or did, did they intend how many, uh, whatever. But actually, if you just go through like what happened next, what happened next, and try and be really meticulous about the detail, you'll probably get most things. And obviously you're looking at the precipitating factors, what happened just before this, why today, why did, why did it go so wrong today? What, what happened in the last week or last month, whatever. Um, you know, obviously was it impossible planned, any preparations they made? So again, not starting when they took the overdose, but what happened in the days beforehand? What were you planning, whatever. Just tell the story in a detailed way and you'll get there. And then obviously the method, exactly what they did and be really specific here in terms of, you know, how many tablets they took, if they can remember, whatever have you, and exactly what was their intention and what was, yeah, all of that stuff there. Hopefully you probably remember. Um, obviously asking about alcohol with the attempt because that sort of increases your impulsivity and makes it more dangerous. And again, what happened afterwards? Did they stay locked in their room with their family all out of the house and then they were found completely by chance or did they, whatever, go and call a friend or whatever, whatever it might be? Just tell the story and you will probably get all these things that you've struggled to cram into your head broskies. Um, and obviously the background you'll talk about and the rest of the history, that's the previous slide, all these risk and protective factors. And then in terms of the current mental state, you know, obviously you're gonna look at the ongoing intent, do they regret it? Uh, and as I said, the hopelessness, if that's there. So this is kind of a nutshell, what you need to cover in a self-harm assessment to cover all the important risk things. Um, and I think the most important things, other than obviously being a detailed narrative, is obviously to be as empathetic and to, to be not judgmental, which is, you know, teaching you to suck eggs, I'm sure that's quite obvious. Um, but I guess you may, another a topic for another day, perhaps to go into more detail with this and the different kind of presentations with self-harm and presentations with self-harm where you think, oh, that, that person clearly, they took such a small overdose or it's such a superficial cut, they, they can't be really trying to, to harm them, to kill themselves. What are they doing it for? And you might assume all sorts of uncharitable things about that they're doing it to achieve this or to communicate this, or whatever it might be. But I guess just remember that nobody wants to be in A&E at whatever, 3 a.m. having taken an overdose or self harm. Like whatever has led them to be in that place at that time, it's probably gonna be a bunch of really rubbish things and whatever judgmental ideas might pop into your head about why they've self harmed, try and, you know, take a broader perspective at what might cause someone to be there. Anyway, that's just a brief thing for you there. And, you know, with any self-harm assessment, you're going to be asking for help for seniors, definitely in F1. You're going to be very much, if you do a liaison psych job, for instance, you're going to be quite closely supervised with this. You'll probably be seeing people with a consultant to start with anyway. But as always, when you're, when you're trying to make a plan to manage risk, always ask for help. As with many medical problems in F1, it's okay to ask for help. Particularly, you know, this is important, serious stuff. There we go. That's kind of all I wanted to say on self-harm, really. Um, there's lots more, obviously, to say, um, but this is a brief overview of the key bits, so we're skipping a lot. Uh, but please shout out if I have any questions. So, assessing risk to others is another thing I'd quickly drop in, because that's a tricky one. And to be honest, you're unlikely to really have to do this uh, unless you're particularly doing a psych job, um, in which case, we have to kind of ask that question all the time, but it's not something you assume of every patient that comes in, are they a danger to, to everyone around them? But we do assume this of psych patients often, which is not a good thing really. Um, hashtag not all psych patients. Obviously there are certain specific groups within psychiatry, so kind of untreated psychosis comorbid with substance abuse, where yes, there is a higher risk 
of, of violence. But actually, the vast majority of, of different types of mental illness, there isn't, they're no more likely to harm you than the next person is. If you think of, and I think, it, I think if I recall, the increase of, in, in violence of the sort of untreated psychosis, comorbid substance, well, no, yeah, untreated psychosis, I think incidence of violence crime is maybe two to four times the average population. But then just being drunk puts you 20 times the average. So you're going to see a hell of a lot of drunk people in A&E who don't have any, well, they might have mental illness, but say they don't have mental illness, they're more likely to, you know, harm people around them than your average psych patient. So just have a bit of perspective with the risks there. But obviously, you do need to do this at some point sometimes in specific circumstances. Hope I've caveated that heavily enough. Um, and I think the easiest way to, to start asking, because if you just ask someone, yeah, do you want to harm people? I don't know if that will get a straight answer or not. Um, but, you know, start by asking if they have any, if there are any people that they feel grievances towards, if they feel angry at anyone in particular. Um, you might find out that actually, you know, for instance, if they they have paranoid schizophrenia, that they believe their neighbours are trying to poison them, and they're, they're obviously really angry about this. Who wouldn't be? Uh, and then, you know, asking, well, would you ever act on that? Would you ever do anything to defend yourself, perhaps? Or would you do any, take it matters into your own hands and try and get back at them? You know, follow logically from the reason they might be violent to start with. That's the most important thing to start with. You know, what 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 you know desperate grievance or anger, whatever it may be, or fear generally, does this person have that they might actually become violent to somebody? Start there and then work from that, rather than just being like, do you have a knife, are you gonna, whatever. And the most important thing really, uh, and this, you know, this is more relevant, particularly in like forensic psych, uh, is do they have a history of violence? Is this something they've done before? That's kind of the single most important risk factor. Actually, if you see someone, someone could have, you know, long history of whatever, paranoid schizophrenia, they've done all sorts of crazy things when unwell, but actually they've never ever harmed a hair on anyone's head. And to be honest, they're, not, they're, they're probably no more likely than the next person uh, in all likelihood. Um, it's, it's all about the history of violence, that's key. So if you're, you know, you hear all these things, when you take a psych history, make sure the patient's not between you and the door, make sure there are no objects in the room that can be used as weapons, all of that rubbish. That's important if you have a patient who has a history of violence or if you have reason to suspect that this is someone who might be dangerous. But to be honest, by, I'm, I walk around my psych ward all the time with people who are floridly psychotic, manic, whatever, and I don't feel particularly unsafe because I know that actually whatever strange things they might be doing and saying and experiencing, they're not really very likely to harm me at all. So there we go. I just thought I'd drop that in my little, little rant. Um, because I think obviously this is a very stigmatized group of patients often because of stuff like this. But this is a good way to approach this question. Moving on, psychiatric emergencies. So um, there aren't, I mean, there, there are loads of things in psych that you act urgently on, but I guess the whole of psych often moves a bit slower than the rest of medicine because you're talking about illnesses that develop over weeks and months. And, you know, acting really quickly in psych is getting something done that day Whereas obviously, you know, in anaesthetics, you have to do it in the next 10 seconds, that kind of thing. So it's a slightly different time frame. Um, so the emergencies are less crash call, what's your OVC kind of thing. And, you know, you do have to deal with that on psych if someone on a psych ward uh, has uh, a heart attack or whatever it may be. But I'm not going to cover that today. I'm just going to look at psychiatric emergencies and basically things that you need to recognize. That's just be able to spot that and if you can do that then generally you have time to read the guidance of what to do about it as long as you don't miss it completely that's kind of the most important thing oh that disappeared for some reason uh so sorry this is another wordy slide don't worry about all this detail but neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a psychiatric emergency that you need to be able to recognize so this is someone who is on an antipsychotic generally uh an anti-dopamine drug uh of which you could name many um can occasionally happen with some other psych drugs, but by and large, it's neuroleptics. So that, that's a very old term for the antipsychotics. And what you're looking out for is muscular rigidity and autonomic instability, particularly really high temperatures, uh, plus or minus any of these things. But if you see that and someone is on an antipsychotic or is recently or whatever, make you just alarm bells ring and talk to someone. Like, you don't have to single-handedly manage that. The, some, the person is unlikely to, to suddenly drop dead in front of you. This is something that needs acting on, like, within hours. Um, so it's, it's relatively 
relatively quick. And, you know, these are some investigations you might find. It's quite dangerous. It can cause multi-organ failure. People have to go to ITU for this. Um, and then serotonin syndrome, a bit less dangerous. I mean, this is more for interest. It broadly looks similar. So if you see kind of any of this combination of things in someone who's taking psych meds, probably talk to someone. That, I'd say, is all you need to really remember. Um, because they look quite similar. For MCQs, you might need to spot the difference between the two. So there you go, you can have these slides to look at later. Um, but you know, the management for both is quite similar. You're gonna stop the medication, but don't probably don't do that yourself necessarily. Like you've probably got a few hours before they were gonna take it anyway. So talk to liaison psych. So in any hospital, there will be some lovely psychiatrists who work in the general hospital, see psych patients on the ward, see psych problems emerging in the general medical patients they do all, all the psych and uh, they are as a rule as in my experience delightful people who will be so happy to give you advice if you think you've spotted some of this um, so go straight to them if, if any if any liaison psychiatrists aren't charming and lovely to you then tell me their names and I'll fight them uh, but, but I can make that promise confidently because they're all really nice people um, but yeah so discuss with, a, with them before just abruptly stopping psychiatric medication but you're going to want to probably stop the medication. And then the management is supportive. So you're going to be speaking to ITU, particularly if someone has pretty clear signs of NMS, because that's bad. And as I said, multi-organ failure. So you just need to recognize this, really, and speak to someone. Simples, I hope. Delirium. Now, I know you, I think you've had a lecture on this, so I'm really not going to go into any detail at all. But just to, you know, remember that it's really important. We see lots and lots of confused older people and it kind of becomes a normal thing. But just the outcomes of people who have delirium versus a similar patient who doesn't have delirium. So much worse. Little, little skulls there to remind you of this. So remember delirium and just a few important things that I think are useful. I don't know if this was in your previous lecture, but pinch me, I find, is a helpful acronym to just pick up the causes of delirium. Um, in terms of what delirium looks like, as I'm sure you know, it's all about inattention. So the inability to do the months of the year backwards or the serial count subtracting sevens from 100. If they just get sidetracked and forget the task halfway through doing it, that's a, a good sign that they might have delirium. And also, obviously, you've got clouding of consciousness and you've got other things. Um, but the memory deficits, you know, that could be there already, whatever. But inattention, this failure of being able to secure your attention on task is really important. So that's what it looks like. And in terms of how you, what you do about it, so you just look for all these things. Pain, infection, it's one of these stupid medical acronyms that isn't really an acronym. Uh, <laughs> hydro, <laughs> um, there we go. Um, so I, yeah, I won't go through all these, because but, but remember that these are important causes of delirium. It's not always just a UTI, um, but yeah, pain. And so you can easily manage a lot of these things. Don't forget to do a PR if you can't find, well, in, in, to be honest, anyone. But if you can't find a cause particularly, you need to be looking for constipation. That's a common cause. It does all sorts of electrolyte haywire as well as being very painful. So that can be a common cause. Um, and yeah, anticholinergic medication, um, things like oxybutynin, they're a key cause as well. So be, be aware of these and then just be aware of this, this sort of stress vulnerability curve of delirium. Um, and the reason I say this, I heard a story once of a, a 62 year old woman, I think, who came in, was very confused, um, and the doctors were like, oh, okay, confused older person, uh, we think it's a UTI, bit of nitroferrin toin, we're probably gonna be okay. But the family were like, this is really, really, like, this is not her at all. She's not usually at all confused. She's normally out on her bike, cycling to her allotment, allotment every day, no sign of cognitive impairment at all, really well fit, and this is so different to normal. And the doctors kind of ignored this, uh, and, in it turned out she had encephalitis and she died. Um, and this wasn't picked up because she was an older person, she was confused, it was kind of assumed that she was way up on the vulnerability curve. Whereas actually, and I mean, vulnerability in terms of delirium, so obviously, you know, if you have dementia, if you have other, if you have, I don't know, chronic alcoholism, all sorts of things that can make you more vulnerable to developing delirium. And actually this person was on the older side, 62, but actually wasn't particularly much. She was pretty well and didn't have any of that to start with. So they should have been looking more up here on the precipitating factors, i.e. things like, I don't know, encephalitis or whatever. Whereas down here is things like UTI. Like if you and I, I don't know, hopefully most of the people on this call, we're down here on the vulnerability. If we get a UTI, we're not going to get delirium. It would take something really bad to give us delirium. This is what this graph is demonstrating. So just remember that. 
take the patient's baseline into account when you're looking for causes and take into account the kind of family's concerns. And also bear in mind, delirium is really horrible for families. Like suddenly their, their grandma just isn't themselves and is talking about, I don't know, seeing bugs everywhere or it just doesn't recognize them or whatever, and it's happened in a day and it's horrible and really scary. So have kindness for those people because they will just not know what is happening and they'll worry, oh my goodness, is this dementia? Is this person gonna be like this forever? Actually, no, in most cases you can treat whatever the cause is and they'll get back to normal. So you can have a lot of, you can have a big role just as a junior doctor clerking that person in making that family's life a bit less horrible for a minute by giving some appropriate reassurance. So there we go, that's delirium. How are we doing for time? Good, good, good. Alcohol withdrawal. That's all I've got on it. Um, I, you know, obviously you want to look out for your ophthalmoplegia and your new confusion and whatever the signs of Wernicke's uh, and, uh, you know, or the less severe end, shakes and anxiety and all of that. You know, you'll have a symptom scoring chart for alcohol withdrawal. But if you just remember, someone who's been drinking a lot, if they come into hospital and is ad are admitted for whatever reason, they will stop drinking dead that day because you can't have alcohol in hospital. So they're gonna suddenly start withdrawing from alcohol by virtue of the fact that you've admitted them. So if everyone, if, if, sorry, if everyone, if someone has an alcohol history, if they've been drinking a lot lately, you need to probably be giving them Pabronex, even if you're not certain how much they've been drinking, just give them because it's harmless. It's, a, you know, obviously you have to fit an IV line and they have to sit there with a little bag of green stuff uh, and, have, well, you know, you can look up the prescribing of, of how that works, but just, just give it to them because it, you can't have too many B vitamins, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and then obviously you follow that up with oral thiamine, but you have to give the Pabronex IV to start with because the alcohol sort of state, if you've been drinking a lot, you, you basically deplete the, your gut's ability to absorb vitamin B, vitamin B. So if you give it orally to start with, they won't be able to absorb it. So you, that's why you give Pabronex for the first three days. There we go. Just remember that. That's my key lesson with alcohol withdrawal. Psychosis. We did that last time. Basically, just don't miss it. Like if you, if you particularly, I don't know, if you're a GP and someone comes in with a bunch of things that look like it could be the prodrome of psychosis, all those sort of weird experiences that we talked about last time, just make sure you refer that within days to a crisis team, to an early intervention psychosis team, because it's something where there is a kind of critical period for early intervention. And the earlier you intervene and start someone on medication and sort of psychological support and all of those things, you can drastically change the course of that illness. Whereas if it grumbles on for weeks, maybe months, it becomes a whole lot harder to treat and to recover from, you know, and it'll just take them longer to recover and maybe they'll be more likely to have further episodes in the future. So just don't miss psychosis is all I'm going to say about that. But you know what it looks like. We talked about that last time. Uh, I assume the lectures are still online if you missed that one. Um, but there we go. And there we go, psychopharmacology drugs. That's what we're doing, we're doing drugs. So what do you really need to know about all of these confusing SNRIs, SSRIs, NARIs, whatever? Well, <laughs> to be honest, just don't stop them suddenly without talking to a psychiatrist. As I already said, really, that's the main thing that I would remember. Like ultimately, yeah, if you remember all the different types and you can recognize them and do all of that, that's, that's good. And you probably should because you have to learn it for finals and it's useful. But the, re the thing you just need to not forget is that you shouldn't stop particularly kind of antipsychotics, lithium, um, mood stabilizers. Do not stop them abruptly because I don't know, oh, this person's got a bit of hyponatremia. Oh, I better stop there, whatever it may be. Like it might be appropriate to stop them for sure, but talk to the liaison psychiatry team before you do that. Because if someone's in with some medical problem and then they, have a relapse of their bipolar disorder. That's a whole, it's very it's difficult to manage psychiatric problems, sort of acute psychiatric problems in a general medical ward. It's also difficult to manage acute medical problems on a psychiatric ward. So it's, it's tricky to manage that person's illness if that happens. So this, but yeah, and the things to be aware of, this is generally the problems that they cause. You know, we talked about NMS already, but they cause a prolonged QTC. So if you spot that on an ECG, if it's particularly if it's 500 or more, but you know, if it's straying above 460, the, the adjusted QT interval, um, you're gonna speak to cardiology and they'll probably be like, eh, keep an eye on it, repeat it in a week. And that's okay, but make sure you speak to someone. So that's my rundown of psychopharmacology. Enjoyed that, I hope. Right, now there is a small quiz. Um, so I will pop up the poll. If you give me a moment, launch polling, there we go. So hopefully you can see this. 
Um, yeah, just start votes. I, I'll try and, yeah, maybe if we're uh, 30 seconds. Okay, we haven't got anyone yet. It's cool. Read the question, have a think. But maybe I'll give it, give it about 45 seconds to a minute. And hopefully we'll have everyone's results in by then. And while I do that, I'll just quickly check out the Q&A. Huh, thank you very much, anonymous attendee. Um, I'll answer the question about delirium in a bit. That's an interesting one though, thank you. Uh, and the polls are coming in, right, we've got, we're nearly halfway there, so keep going right on the chat. Oh no, right, okay. Apologies for all of my references <laughs> to the previous lecture about psychosis, um, which I now realize probably most of you went at, so uh, my bad. Um, I mean, you know, if someone is hearing voices, if they've suddenly become very, very socially withdrawn and maybe are slightly s saying some strange things or just their family feel like they're not themselves anymore and this is a young person, um, worry. And you can't do any harm by referring to the psych team. But make sure you do a kind of good mental state when you're referring them. Um, sorry, that was a very brief <laughs> summary of all of psychosis. Right, cool. Um, I'm going to... If you can all quickly dash in the last few answers, I'll close polling in about 10 seconds or so. I've got to have 10 more people, but all right, I'll get to 30. Okay, right, I'm gonna end the polling now. So this is a quite a tricky question, I suppose. So uh, I put you off a bit with the grab and stab. Uh, I made that up. That's not a real thing that anyone says, at least I hope it isn't. Um, <laughs> but in this case, actually, um, that is the correct, uh, the correct answer, and I'll tell you for why uh, if I just advance the slide. So, um, let's just let's just whiz through these. So, stop his oxybutynin. Great idea. You're absolutely right. That's oh, oh sorry, just to go back a bit. Uh, delirium. Right. We talked about that. So uh, he's taking oxybutynin. That might well have caused the delirium. So you're going to stop it. Very good. You are going to do that. But um, this is overnight. Oh, sorry, I didn't say it was overnight. Okay, that's bad. Oh no, overnight, yeah, I did. So overnight and you've been, you're the doctor on call and you're called to the ward and he's trying to climb the furniture. Yeah, you're probably gonna cross off the oxybutynin on the drug chart, but he wasn't gonna take it again until tomorrow evening anyway. So you need to do something, something more urgent than that. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a wrong answer. I suppose it's more of these, what's the most appropriate quick thing. Um, Haloperidol, great answer. So you would often do that. However, this was a horrible, tricky question. He's taking cinnamon which is a uh, combination of L-dopa and carbidopa, I think. Uh, it's Parkinson's. So this person has Parkinson's. You do not, under any circumstances, give antipsychotics to someone with Parkinson's. I say that. You sometimes do if you're a consultant and you know what you're doing. But <laughs> uh, as an F1 particularly, you're gonna, the, the correct answer is you avoid haloperidol uh, and any, any, any antipsychotics. But haloperidol is the one you might... Uh, be using in this acute situation. Avoid it in anyone who has a whiff of Parkinson's because you can make the Parkinson's sort of acutely worse. But uh, good guess is there. Um, guided relaxation exercises, you know, that's not a bad idea. I guess I would hope that the nursing team had tried their best to de-escalate the situation. If he's climbing the furniture, this sort of jokey way to put it, but he's quite at risk. This is an elderly gentleman. He's at risk of falling and hurting himself. He's probably shouting about the spiders. Um, I, d I think guided relaxation in this particular instance, wonderful though it is, is unlikely to succeed. So the correct answer um, is giving lorazepam. You give the haloperidol, oh sorry, and the other reason why this, uh, this is the wrong answer because it's haloperidol. Um, if he's climbing the furniture of that spiders, he, you might be able to randomly persuade him to take uh, a tablet, but actually to be honest, you're probably gonna need to give it IM. Um, but you know, it's a tricky, difficult question. There are obviously risks in giving someone uh, IM medications if they're elderly. Um, so you're gonna try all sorts of other things before that, but it may well, and I mean, in this case, this is the most right answer, is to give them something, so a benzodiazepine to just settle the delirium and reduce this risk to, to themselves and others. Um, but yes, ignore, grab and stab. I made that up, it's very inappropriate. Uh, so there we go. Going on, the next question. Said gentleman later wakes up and tries to leave the ward, mumbling incoherently about the spiders. What are you gonna do? Let me open the poll again. Uh, 
how do I go to the next? Oh, that's how. Oh, sorry. It's labeled in a funny way. Okay. Um, fire away with your answers to this question. While you do that, I'll quickly see what's on the chat. Mm, so yes, you can give haloperidol to patients with dementia. It's just Parkinson's. So if they have Parkinson's dementia or yeah, dementia with part, you know, or in the Parkinson's plus, whatever, you know, there's lots of dementia that comes along with Parkinson's. You don't give um, antipsychotics, but you can just in people who have Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. Could the previous question be alcohol withdrawal? Yes, it certainly could. Um, still probably the right answer may well be to give, um, yeah, and particularly is the sort of the Lilliputian seeing lots of small things crawling around. That's a classic alcohol withdrawal thing, but is also very common in delirium. Um, the management, I think, in this case would still be about the same. Okay, so how many do we have so far? 24, okay. I'll give it another 15 seconds or so for the last six or so people who voted last time. All right, five seconds. Can we get the last? Pop your questions in. Obviously, it's all anonymous, so I have no idea who you are, whether whether you're asking the right question. Uh, okay, I'm going to end the polling now, if that's okay. Oh, last one in. Good. Right, so we've got a good spread of answers here. Uh, so I'll just whiz through them again. And this is an introduction to the next brief section on the Mental Health Act. So send him on his merry way. You're probably not going to do that because he's clearly confused and mumbling about spiders. He's not going to be safe wandering around at night um, in whatever city you are in. So um, good thought, but no, that's obviously the least restrictive option. Um, fill out a section five two. Good question. So um, for someone who has a diagnosed mental illness, you can then use the Mental Health Act, but this person does not. They just have delirium, they have an acute um, impairment of the sort of the mind or brain. Um, so it's not, the Mental Health Act actually isn't applicable in this situation. And, um, you know, if you did do a 5-2, basically, the, as I'll, I'll reiterate on the next slide, if you, you just, well, you want to keep this person safe and not do anything ridiculous, and you want to document the reasons why you've done what you've done. But ultimately, if you make a sensible decision and you happen to do a 5-2 instead of a whatever it may be, no one's going to you 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 you're gonna be okay as long as you haven't done something horribly negligent like probably if you send him on his merry way you might be in a bit of trouble um equally if you cuff him to the chair but um so make a recommendation for section two uh would be lovely a as i said the mental health act wouldn't quite apply here um but also you have to be a section 12 approved doctor or a, a registrar at least to be able to do that sorry no you have to be a yeah you, you can't do it as an F1, is all I'm saying. Um, so in this case, you'd fill out a deprivation of liberty safeguards, because what you're going to do is you're going to tell the nursing team, we need to keep this gentleman on the ward in his best interests. He lacks capacity to, to make a decision about whether he leaves the ward. He can't make that decision now. So in his best interests, we're going to make this decision for him and we're going to keep him on the ward. Then what you have to do in that situation is fill out the deprivation of liberty safeguards because you need to safeguard this person whose liberty you are depriving. Um, and that's what adults is. Uh, and it's actually, and I say fill out adults, and so nurses can do this. So you don't necessarily, but it's a good thing to do so you know what, it, what is in it. Um, maybe when you're an F2 and you become a bit more cynical, you'd be like, I know you can do it, nurses, you know it. But I'm joking, you'd probably review him. Um, but yeah, and you don't, it's not as if he's running, he's nearly reached the door, quickly write the form faster. Um, you, uh, you stop him and that's in his best interest and you're acting in his safety. So that happens first. And then the paperwork happens, you know, as soon as you, like, as soon as you can. But it's not as if the dolls has to be in place before you're allowed to close the door to the ward. So this is the right answer in that case. Hope that wasn't too confusing, but moving on, the Mental Health Act and the Mental Capacity Act, or MCA. So um, just some key, I know this is another thing that's a big confusing topic in psychiatry. I would say, uh, as an F1, you, you will hardly have anything to do with the Mental Health Act, to be honest. It's all about the Mental Capacity Act in a general hospital. If you have a psych job, you will have lots of dealings with the Mental Health Act, but you probably will be just learning about it. You won't have to do much yourself but section 5.2 is the exception. And that's actually, sorry, I'm going around in circles with myself a little bit. You, you may well have to do a section 5.2 at some times in a patient who has a 
diagnosed or you suspect they have a, a mental illness um, that isn't just acute delirium. So, um, starting with the Mental Capacity Act, as I'm sure you remember, just some key points. You presume capacity, so you don't start by assuming that someone lacks capacity. You have to kind of have evidence that they don't have capacity. Um, and that's just a case of, you know, not unnecessarily taking away people's freedoms. And you're asking, does the person have an impairment? Oh, sorry, this is legalistic definitions. But yeah, so the functioning of their mind or brain, some acute impairment um, about a specific decision. So your gentleman who you've detained on the ward, they, they didn't have capacity, and you can document the obvious reasons for this. They didn't have capacity to decide to leave the ward because the reasons they're leaving the ward are all to do with spiders, and actually now they're talking about police, and now they, and they're, they're starting to fall asleep. They don't, they can't, their decision-making apparatus is clearly not working. Um, so they can't make that decision. But actually, the tea trolley comes round. Do they want tea or coffee? They have capacity to make that decision. I once, sorry, this is going on a rant. I got so angry once when I was working as a care assistant in a care home in my gap year because we were, I was all the, we were in a room with, with lovely old people who all had dementia and they couldn't make a lot of decisions. But I went round and asked them all what they wanted for pudding. And some of them wanted crumble and some of them wanted jelly and ice cream. And I got back to the, the kitchen and they're like, this many want this and this one. And they were like, oh, I've made them all jelly and ice cream because they have dementia. And I got so annoyed because that's so I'm just <laughs> pounding the table with my fist. Um, <laughs> that's that's not how capacity works. Someone can perfectly well make those kinds of decisions. You've got to apply this to specific decisions, like can they consent to this treatment or can they consent to walking off the ward in the middle of the night? So there we go. That's the mental capacity, and you obviously treat in their best interests. Um, so yeah, this is someone maybe who has advanced dementia and they need urgent surgery to. Uh, relieve bowel obstruction, um, but they don't have capacity to make that decision. Um, so you will involve, you make make a medical decision in their best interests and you will involve the next of kin. You might involve, if they don't have an next of kin, an independent mental capacity adv advocate. Um, you know, that kind of thing is going to be a big thing that your consultants are going to be handling. So don't worry too much about it, but that's what you do. It's all about in their best interests. If you do this, you can't go too far wrong, even if you do the form slightly incorrectly, is, is my main learning point. Um, and in terms of what you need to know about the Mental Health Act, firstly, so Mental Capacity Act, if someone lacks capacity to consent for their bowel obstruction surgery, you can still do it in their best interests. Mental Health Act is specifically for mental health conditions. It's for psych this, this the conditions you've learned about in psych, psychosis, whatever, all of those things. <laughs> I could only list one mental health condition and I'm an actual psychiatrist, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's what they're for. And you can't treat physical health problems. So just because someone has uh, schizophrenia, they're detained on the psych ward and they are, uh, they, they want to leave because they want to go and, I don't know, um, climb to the top of a building and set up a anti um, 5G, whatever. Anyway, they want to do all that. So clearly they don't have, you're, you're detaining them under the Mental Health Act to treat them for that illness. But if they need some, I don't know, surgery or whatever, and they're refusing to have it, you can't just force them to have that if it's irrelevant to their mental health. But yeah, you, know, you can't make them have mental, physical health treatments, as it were, under the Mental Health Act. And this is just a thing that comes up in hospitals. Like someone might be on the, under a section, but in a general ward, and they'll be like, well, can we just give them whatever treatment we want because they're under the Mental Health Act? No, you can't. Uh, and lastly, you may have to do a section 5.2. This is, uh, for instance, yeah, someone who has, I don't know, uh, really severe depression and they want to leave the ward before they've finished their um, treatment for their, their paracetamol overdose. Um, you can't force them to have the NAC. If they refuse to have that, you can't make them have it. But you may be able to detain them on the ward using a section 5.2 if you're worried that they're going to go off and harm themselves and that's related to obviously their mental health mental illness and yeah in fact treatment for overdose that might be one of those that can sometimes apply under the mental health act because things that are direct sequelae of the mental illness can be treated under the mental health act sometimes so actually don't take my word for that one but if you have to do a 5.2 it's a two-page form it's not too hard but talk to a senior about it it's nothing to be scared of um basically if you're worried that someone with a mental illness um, should stay where they are until further assessment then. And, and that's all the five two is. You as a doctor think this person needs to not be a, allowed out into the world because they might harm themselves. Um, so you're going to keep them here until a bunch of other doctors, section 12 approved and whatever. You can do a proper mental health act assessment. The five two just allows you to keep them there until that happens. That's what a five two is for. 
there we go. That's all I think the most important thing. Right, you now have 20 minutes or so, and I'll probably take slightly less than that to look at medically unexplained symptoms. Um, I'm just seeing if there's anything in the chat. Sorry, uh, so in answer to the question on the chat, it is a dolls. Dolls was the correct answer to that question. Um, and I think I've answered the others. Uh, Eating disorders are a risk factor for, I'm assuming that was in relation, yeah, 707, in relation to risk factors for suicide, certainly, yeah. Um, cool. And I'll come to the Q&A at the end, I think that's probably best. So if you have any broad questions, uh, drop them in the Q&A and I can come to them at the end. Right, medically unexplained symptoms. So this is something that I guess comes under the umbrella of psych to some extent, but it's a problem that is extremely common in all doctors have to try and help patients with. So it's not something you can really just leave to psychiatry. It's something that as an F1, you will see a lot. And probably if your experience is anything like mine, your seniors will be throwing up their hands, be like, oh, it's just medically unexplained symptoms, discharge. Um, and that's their response. And you know, I guess, whatever. Um, as an F1, I encourage you to, to do better than that. And I will show you how. So um, what we're talking about when we're looking at medically unexplained symptoms, it's a often maligned sort of group of things. So here are some things that you might associate with this bunch of things. So I mean, a medically unexplained symptom, someone is having a symptom and there doesn't appear to be a cause for it. That's what we're talking about. It's not medically explained. But what gets tarred with this brush? Well, malingering. So that's when you deliberately fake symptoms for some external gain. So this is the person who, I don't know, pretends to have neck pain after a car accident so they can get an insurance claim or wants, I don't know, pretends to have uh, appendicitis so they can get leave from prison or something like that. And this is nothing to do with mental illness. So that's, that's one thing. Um, factitious disorders are very interesting and I would love to do another uh, session on it at some point, but this is where you deliberately fake symptoms in order to seek validation or care. Um, so the aim here is not money or, or freedom or whatever. It's actually, they want the medical care in and of itself. Now these two things are not medically unexplained symptoms. So, don't, if you see medical unexplained symptoms, do not be, I shouldn't have really started the presentation with those two, but I'm putting a big cross through them. What we're talking about are functional symptoms. And these are symptoms where there's none of this, there's no, they're not faked at all, is the, the main thing I'm saying. Um, the symptom is perfectly there and the person is experiencing it and they have no control over it. Um, but there doesn't appear to be a structural cause. And this is a useful way, I think, to approach it. Function versus structure. So a functional symptom, there is a problem in the way the body is functioning. So IBS, for instance, the gut is dysfunctioning a little bit, but there's no structural reason for that. You look, you do biopsies, whatever, and you can't see any structural problem with the gut. Um, but they're still having this functional problem. There's this dysfunction. So that's what a functional symptom means. Um, and it is like a big deal. You will see a lot of this, like and I'm not just making a bold claim. This is roughly how common, and this is quite an old study now, um, but in my experience certainly remains true. Um, we're around the 50% mark. For many, this is hospital outpatient departments, the percentage of symptoms that they see where they're, they are medically unexplained. So we can't find, we can't fit this in a neat diagnostic box. So chest pain, the, where the trops are normal and the ECG is fine. Um, Rheumatology, you've got things like fibromyalgia and, and other things where, you know, clearly it's this big syndrome of symptoms that are causing this person great distress and disability, but you can't often find any abnormalities in the serology or whatever. Oh, sorry, chest, um, this actually, chest, I meant um, respiratory. So this is sort of, for instance, anxiety induced asthma attacks type things as an example. Cardiology is the chest pain. Gastroenterology, oh my goodness, so much functional stuff. My first job on F1 was gastro. Uh, and that's obviously IBS is a functional, is a medically unexplained syndrome. Um, uh, and there are many other things. Functional gastroparesis is a big one uh, that causes immense distress and disability. Neurology, you've got functional neurological symptoms, paralysis, pain, headaches, all those sort of things. Pain is, is probably like 80% of this. Um, and then gynecology, you've got things like complex regional, sort of complex pelvic pain, stuff like that, that remains medically unexplained. So by and large, it's over half, it's literally over half of the symptoms presenting to hospital outpatient departments. So it's, it's really common is what I'm saying. And, and you know, slightly more common in women by a little bit. So it's often dismissed as being all in the person's head because you can't see a structural cause. Therefore you assume that the problem isn't real as a doctor who is raised in the medical model where, um, 
a I don't know a specific structural problem causes a specific symptom and there's your whole explanation for the illness and these things obviously don't fit into that model so we kind of oh well the person might be making it up or they're just sort of I don't know over exaggerating or whatever it's very we, we dismiss these often um, but in reality there's a very yeah there's a complex etiology to these it's not just it's a cause by stress you know often there is a relationship to that but it's very dismissive and unhelpful to just be like, oh, don't worry, it's caused by stress, it's fine. If you, know, if you are experiencing central crushing chest pain and you go to A&E thinking you're dying and you have an ECG and, a tr and they do all blood tests and all is really serious, and then they come back, oh no, actually, uh, don't worry, the trops are normal, ECG is normal, it's probably just stress. You still feel like you were dying, so that's not gonna help you. Um, and interestingly, it's associated with this lack of information from doctors. So in that example, the person gets sent home just being told, don't worry about it, it's all normal, which is sharply contrasted with how it felt, which is markedly abnormal and very you know, distressing. So how do we make sense of this? And, the, you know, and there is a relationship with psychiatric comorbidity, but it's not that straightforward. So some studies have found a strong positive correlation with diagnosis of anxiety and depression, but equally the study that on the previous slide found it wasn't associated with psychological symptoms on the hands. So it's not as if you can straightforwardly say it's caused by depression or anxiety. Um, there is a relationship there, but it's not clear. So I've just drawn a helpful little flow diagram to try and make sense of these a little bit because, you know, I still haven't explained them very much. Um, this is my attempt to make sense of it with the best of the sort of the theory that I have understood that I've packaged down for you in a very simplistic form. So take it with a pinch of salt. But we have a symptom and say it's, um, let's start, let's say vomiting. Uh, someone vomits after every time they eat or they have abdominal pain and vomiting every time they eat. Now they have endoscopies, they have, um, x-rays, they have all of this stuff and they can't find any structural cause. So what is causing this? Clearly it's happening. The person has no control over it. They're still experiencing this pain every time they eat. It's completely real, but there isn't a structural cause. So how do we explain that? Well, one way to explain it, which is, I don't know, I find sort of helpful, is it's just the central nervous system is really, really complex. And sometimes it does stuff that we can't explain for reasons that are not completely clear. And, you know, <laughs> I'm very much buying into the medically unexplained thing there. I, I, I see. Um, but think about, for instance, tension headaches. We don't really know why they happen. Pretty much everyone gets them. We understand that they're not a serious problem, but equally we know that they're very real and they're uncomfortable and annoying. That is also kind of just a quirk of the central nervous system, an, an unfortunate, painful, distressing quirk. Um, but that's all that we can say about it, I suppose. But sometimes you see particularly, I don't know, in a story that I will tell you very shortly, it starts off with uh, an explainable cause. For instance, you have a viral illness at the beginning that gives them a bit of tummy pain or whatever, a sickness, and that, but that came and went and the symptom is still there. Or you maybe, there's a particular acute stressful event where um, the symptom might start in the context of that, so you can call it somatization, but actually the symptom persists maybe after that stress has gone away. So you have this symptom. And then what can often happen uh, is particularly, you know, take stomach, tummy pain and vomiting. Someone's going to be quite worried about that. They have all these investigations, it keeps coming back normal, but you're still, you're having this real symptom and you're probably going to worry that it's cancer or you're going to worry that it's something else really serious that the doctors haven't found yet. And a side effect of that is that you are going to pay very intense attention to that symptom and be kind of be thinking about it all the time, kind of expecting it to recur. Um, constantly thinking, oh, I've eaten, okay, I'm, I'm, I, the pain is going to hit me any minute. And that can have a kind of exaggerating effect on symptoms. This is one mechanism that they think medically unexplained symptoms can be partly sort of reinforced and persist, um, is the sort of intense, intense attention that you pay to the symptom once it starts. Um, and then there are other mechanisms as well. So if you expect something to be painful, it very often will be. When you're taking blood on the wards, you probably say sharp scratch. I usually say little tiny scratch, um, just to minimize it even further. But you don't go say, I'm gonna stab you with a needle and it's gonna really hurt. Because if you did that, they'd be so tense and anxious about it that it would genuinely hurt more. And like studies have shown that this is a thing, as you're probably aware. So if we expect a symptom to recur, it very often does this, this interesting thing that the brain does. I don't know. I can't explain it. All to do with quirks and sinus. So expectations is very important. 
And then there's also unconscious gain. And this is a tricky one because it can look like someone is putting on a symptom deliberately when they're very much not. But nonetheless, the situation is that they really didn't enjoy their job. And now they can't go to work because they're having this pain and vomiting every time they eat. So now they're at home every day. And you're gonna be like, oh, you, you wanted to leave that job and now you've got this perfect reason to leave it. Oh, it looks a bit suspicious. But it's, there's nothing deliberate about it at all. And actually it's an unconscious sort of gain. And to make sense of all of this, I will tell you a story of a patient I saw when I was in F2. Uh, he was a parole officer, so he worked for the prison service. And he, um, he paroled someone, I don't know what the correct term is, had someone on his parole list um, about six years pre prior to that who'd done some crime. Uh, and they decided that this individual was safe to, to go out and not be on parole anymore. So this parole officer, who was my patient, was part of the decision-making team, right? Well, and he was his parole officer. We're going to let this guy go free. So they did. But then a year before I saw my patient, this guy who he'd paroled six years previously committed an incredibly high profile terrorist attack. Um, like you know, one of the ones that you would immediately have heard of. Really bad. And obviously the parole officer felt awful, inconsolably awful about this. You know, and you know, his whole team agreed, you know, this is a team decision. At the time we made we did the made the right call. There was no way we could have known that um this was gonna happen. But he still felt obviously immensely guilty. So this massive stress, and every day he was going into work feeling the kind of weight of what he'd done in his mind. Obviously, it wasn't something that he'd done, it was something someone else had done that he had no control over. But this is what he felt. So work was really stressful. And then um, he, his, he kind of a straw that broke the camel's back, if you like. His wife um, developed, I think it was anxiety and depression or something. She had some sickness from work, um, so she couldn't work. Uh, so all the financial onus was on him. Um, and it was, you know, things suddenly got 10 times more stressful in the space of a week. Um, and around this time, uh, he'd been to, I don't know, some nights out and had some, some alcohol, not, a, not an excessive amount by any means, but he got a bit of gastritis through drinking a bit more than he normally would. So he had some pain and vomiting related to that um, classic, you know, gastritis pain. But then the gastritis went away, as far as we can tell, because he'd had 15 endoscopies or something by the time I saw him, and there was no uh, evidence of gastritis anymore. But the symptom was still there, it had stayed there, and it hadn't gone away, and he was becoming increasingly debilitated by it. He couldn't eat, basically. When I saw him, he was on a surgical ward with an NG tube, because he couldn't eat, because it was so painful. Every time he ate, he just vomited. It was awful. And he'd had all of the investigations, all of the doctors had been like, Ugh. Um, <laughs> because we hadn't found any structural cause for it, so we didn't have any surgery that we could do. Um, so he was stuck. Uh, and um, so I saw him um, with kind of, you know, I can't claim any credit for this. It was under strict supervision with my consultant who was excellent at dealing with these sorts of things. And we just, we went through everything and we pieced together the story. Um, and we, something that I did, which I thought, uh, which my consultant told me to do, sorry, is we did a timeline of like exactly when the symptoms occurred, like when they started, when they got worse, all of this. And we plotted it out on a line on a bit of paper. And then we also plotted out what had happened in his life around those times. And suddenly a whole load of links emerged that he hadn't even seen before. Um, so the, for instance, the thing about his wife going off sick, he'd been so stressed at the time, he hadn't even remembered really that actually that was when his symptom really took hold and this, this vomiting and pain got so much worse and started to prevent him going to work. Um, and of course, you know, he did feel better when he was at home to an extent because he didn't have the ever present stress of the, you know, thinking about the thing, the, the, the incident um, with the guy he'd paroled. And that was, he wanted to work. He was, he loved his job and he was very good at it. But the, actually just the removal of that stress on an unconscious level, his brain was like, things are better now. Let's probably reinforce whatever we're doing now that's allowing this to happen. I guess <laughs> that's my theory for what his, psychon what his un un unconscious did at that time. But he had no control of the symptom and he wanted to go back to work, but the reality was actually his anxiety levels were lower now that he wasn't at work. And that did reinforce the symptom kind of at an unconscious sort of level. And we pieced all this together. And, and I guess the key things that we did in that conversation is firstly making, trying to make, make a bit more sense of it all. And I didn't go in there saying, right, I think this problem is caused by stress, even though I might've been thinking that in the back of my mind. And it wasn't really caused by stress. It was caused by this really complex tangle of stuff. And he'd had, you know, a, a real, if you want to call it that, I hate that sort of 
terminology when we come to medical and unexplained symptoms, or organic or whatever. He had a structural cause for the symptom to start with. Um, but then the symptom had persisted. And we could look at all of these ways in which the symptom had kind of helped him in a funny sort of way or on an unconscious level, even though it didn't really help him. Like he didn't want to be having this symptom. He didn't want to be stuck at home. And we also, yeah, so making a really, made sure I really understood everything about this problem. And then introducing the idea that functional problems, functional symptoms are a thing. And this is so important because I think many people's experiences, oh my goodness, you've got all this pain or you've got all this chest pain or you've got all whatever. There must be something seriously wrong, say the doctors. We'll do all these tests. Oh, it's all normal. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, bye. <laughs> and that's kind of often what happens. And there's no acknowledgement that actually we see this so much. This is a thing that we know about. We know about functional symptoms. We see them all the time. We don't need to say, don't know what this is. We can say this is a functional symptom. We don't know a lot about why it happens. It's a, to do with the central nervous system just misbehaving if you, or whatever word you want to use. But we know that it's a very common problem that lots of people experience in circumstances like this. And you can draw out all like very commonly it's caused by something starts at the beginning that sets it off and, and then the symptom sticks around because various other things reinforce it or you know, whatever it may be. And all the time, obviously, you're making it very clear that you don't think the person is making this up, the person is exaggerating their symptoms, uh, the person's symptoms aren't real because I can't see them as a doctor. You want to completely avoid thinking any of that because it's not true. Uh, and if you think it, even if you don't say it, it can sometimes come across. So be really careful kind of your attitudes towards these symptoms. Anyway, so we had this good conversation. It was like a couple of consultations of about an hour to gradually introduce all these ideas. I kind of bunged it all together to you in five minutes. And six months later, the symptom had gone. We cured him of this incredibly debilitating, horrible thing. And I don't know what we did. I think lots of things. I think lots of things in his life has changed. In many ways, it just sort of went away of its own accord. But I think having an understanding of it, um, having an appreciation that, oh no, I, need, I can stop worrying about this actually, because it's not some horrible, Gastro gastrointestinal stromal tumor or whatever that I've read about on Google that no one's found yet that's still there and it's going to kill me. It's not that. It's this really common problem that looks very, very similar in all sorts of other people. Loads of people have abdominal pain and vomiting as a functional symptom. It's, it's not uncommon. Loads of people have this. The doctors know what it is. You know, we don't know exactly what causes it, but it's okay. I can worry less. They've done all the appropriate investigations. And breaking that kind of cycle of anxiety and maybe modifying their expectations a little bit. And that's a really important thing. Being like, we know generally, unless there's anything that hold, that's keeping these symptoms there, um, these symptoms will tend to go away of their own accord after a period of time. And that is true. And you can say that with confidence. And just the expectation that that will happen can make quite a big difference to, can cause, the, can allow the symptom, can allow the knot to untangle itself, if you like. I'm using a lot of sort of woolly language in this, but this is what we did and we cured this guy uh, and it was pretty exciting um, because it was a horrible problem that he was completely debilitated by. So I guess I'm telling you this to give you some hope for these symptoms um, because you can do something about it. You can make a positive diagnosis. You don't be like, I don't know what this is. You'd be like, we think this is a functional syndrome. Um, and you don't have to say that for definite when they walk in the door because obviously you don't know. You can introduce the idea, if, particularly if someone's come in a lot with unexplained chest pain, the trops have been normal. I mean, like, you know, there's this thing called non-cardiac chest pain. It's a functional problem. It's very common. It might be that. We'll do all the right investigations now to make sure you're safe, but that might, we expect that the test will come back normal um, because I suspect this may well be the case. And, you know, emphasizing that this is a thing that happens to lots of people. They're not crazy. And reassuring them and trying to break that cycle of anxiety. Find out what it is they're worried the symptom is, because if you tell them it's normal and then send them away without really finding out what, what they're petrified it might be, you're not going to get to that. Um, and then giving them an explanation of some kind. And you can choose your own explanation. Oh, sorry. Um, I think kind of an analogy with a tension headache that everyone understands is a functional symptom that is not dangerous is a helpful one. Um, and talking about just structure versus function and uh, is maybe helpful, whatever, um, are all good things to do. But you can make a difference with these symptoms and particularly early on in the course of them, if you don't allow the symptom to take root, if you can have some good conversations about it that change their expectations towards the start, you can completely change 
the course of the illness because people can have horrible debilitating functional symptoms that last a lifetime and are just so miserable um, and it can be increasingly difficult to shift them at that stage but if you can change the course of that early on you, you can potentially make a big difference to them anyway and yeah these people often get investigated to high heaven millions and millions are spent on unnecessary investigations um, where the doctors kind of know that it's a functional symptom to be honest but the patient's really 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 worried and pushing for the next one um, you know you want to do the investigations you feel you need to reassure yourself that you're not missing something some serious structural problem and then and you know caveat that with you know i expect this might well come back normal because this might well be a functional syndrome which is you know an okay thing to have uh, and then stop there because you don't, if the more investigations you do, the more the person starts to suspect that each, that all the previous investigations were wrong, but the next one is going to find the horrible tumor in me or whatever it might be. And that's going to, and they pin on the hope and that, and then that's wrong. And then the cycle just repeats. And each successive investigation is less reassuring. And you get into a bit of a nightmare situation where you start harming the people due to whatever invasive investigations you're doing. So remember that. And yeah, just doing a careful history, making sure that they feel very listened to, they feel that you're not dismissed them, that you've really understood what the problem is like for them, and you've still been like, okay, yeah, I know what this is, it's a functional problem. And not, yeah, keeping them on the same page as you is so key because you have things like the Hoover test, I think it's called, where you can spot someone with fake um, uh, leg paralysis because you get them to press their, they, you know, sitting in a chair and they, they push one, um, thigh down and they, they can't do it, it's paralyzed, it's really weak. You're like, okay, cool. And then you get them to lift the other leg while sneakily uh, maintaining you know, pressure on the, the first leg. And you notice that they actually can push their leg down to the ground when they're doing kind of contrapuntal motion or whatever it was. So, aha, you have a sneaky you clue as the doctor that you're not gonna tell them about, but you suspect this is not a real symptom. That's such a wrong way to do it. You wanna be using those kinds of tests to be like, look, this leg isn't really paralyzed and that's a good thing. That means this is a functional problem and we can do things about that. This isn't some horrible neurological issue that actually would be much worse because often they're very difficult to treat and require horrible invasive things. It's good that you can actually still move your leg even though you can't do it consciously, you can do it unconsciously and that means we have something to work with. For instance, is a way to, to do that kind of investigation where you can do in sort of functional neurological stuff. Yeah, keeping them on the same page as you, not having the sneaky, oh, I suspect it's a functional thing, but I'm not going to tell them. That's just so unhelpful. Right, cool. We've slightly overrun. I'm sorry. Um, I will take questions now, but um, these are the take home messages from today. Um, yeah, I think they're all fairly self explanatory. So I will hop over to the chat um, and answer a few questions there. Right. Um, could you give haloperidol for rapid trank in Louis body? No. I mean, I'm not saying never. You maybe as a consultant level decision, if there's no other option, you might do. But Louis body dementia is, well, yeah, no, that's, yeah, no, sorry, ignore me. Louis body dementia is, is caused by, is a sort of Parkinson's like process. So the right answer to that question is, is no, you don't. You know, I mean, if <laughs> the problem is, I guess if they haven't got mo motor symptoms, then what are you going to make worse by giving them the antipsychotic? But actually, if they haven't got motor symptoms, then you won't have diagnosed them with Lewy body dementia, because in order to have Lewy body dementia, you have to have Parkinson's symptoms that started within a year. Oh, sorry, dementia that started within a year of the movement symptoms. So if you give that person haloperidol, you're going to worsen their Parkinson's. Um, so I don't, you don't worsen it permanently, but it's bad, so don't do it. Um, I am for non Parkinson's patients. Is there prefer preference for I am haloperidol or lorazepam? Um, not, it tends to be a, at a trust level type thing. So there will be rapid tranquilization guidelines for um, your trust. So just check them out. You're, you're unlikely, to, you're not going to be running in there. The patient's just about to climb out of the window and you've got the syringe in your hand and you have no time to think. You just, <laughs> that's, that's not a thing. You're going to be making a relatively considered decision um, because this is going to take, you know, 20 minutes or at least to sort out, to draw up the medication, to safely get them in a place where you can give that injection without it being horribly traumatic and stressful and injuring them, whatever. It's, you've got enough time to look up what your trust guidance for, for rapid tranquilization is. Um, 
and sometimes you give both, sometimes you might give one or the other. Um, haloperidol is, is perfectly good and is safe um, for people who don't have Parkinson's or some other things, so it's often used, but yeah, I hope that's useful. Oh, sorry, the feedback link is there. I've left the slides up for too long. So yes, uh, and there's my email if you would like that, if you have any further questions. Um, okay, right, I'm gonna quickly hop over to the Q&A and answer any questions there. Obviously, if you have to go, that's fine. Um, can emotional stress cause delirium? I'm not sure. It is certainly generally thought of as a medical problem. It's like acute brain failure um, where you have some sort of overwhelming toxic insult to the brain um, but it, pain is also a big cause so in that case I would say potentially it's I guess it's unlikely <sighs> if you see someone who's and they had a really horrible bereavement or traumatic thing and they're an older person who was already vulnerable to de delirium and they start developing delirium like things you would I guess you'd you'd have to look back on that and be like was it um, delirium or was it maybe more like some kind of transient psychotic episode if it was just caused by the kind of stress generally delirium tends to happen where you've got a whole load of things knocking them but then again in someone with really advanced dementia who really is their ability to kind of stay grasped on the present moment is is, is quite I find that quite difficult already because of the level of dementia then going to a different place can kind of cause them to become acutely confused um, and what you might call delirium delirious so actually, sorry, going back on myself. So kind of yes, but only in someone who's particularly vulnerable to delirium is the long-winded answer to that question. Age distribution for medically unexplained symptoms. It varies depending on the symptom. So it's very often younger people, but by no means only. So I mean, obviously in older people who are more at risk of getting um, obscure cancer, well, just sort of some malignancy, you're gonna be more worried and less likely to start assuming that it might be uh, medically unexplained. But equally, I've seen a 60 year old woman who had, uh, she was having a series of injections for um, a <clears throat> lymphoma treatment a few years ago. And then the injections finished and she was, and that was the end of her treatment because she was cured. But she was really, really worried about the end of this treatment because like, I'm not being treated anymore. What if it comes back? So, and the last injection was given by a different nurse and it was a bit painful and it was different to normal. And she ever since then was worried that this injection had gone wrong and it harmed her in some way. And she got abdominal pain, she got vomiting and it went on for six months and nobody could find the cause. And it was all to do with, yes, it had been caused by an injection that had gone, you know, caused her a little bit of acute pain at the time. But the reason that pain had continued and, and got worse and caused, had other symptoms along with it was all this massive anxiety around her treatment for cancer finishing, the worry that the cancer, and then of course, when she did get a bit of vomiting, oh my goodness, the cancer has come back. So all of that. Um, so it can happen in older people is what I'm saying, but most commonly tends to be young people. And as I said, slightly more common in women, but, and I mean, for instance, non-cardiac chest pain is very common in actually in the, in men who are actually quite at risk of having cardiac problems. So, so kind of middle-aged men often have a lot of non-cardiac chest pains so and functional pain that is sort of cardiac-like. Um, but equally gastroparesis, um, IBS, that sort of thing, is often quite younger people. Anyway, that's a long-winded enough answer. Ah, oh, thank you for recommending that. Uh, oh, he, yes, that is a good website. It is excellent. So that's mainly focused on functional neurological symptoms, um, but do check out neurosymptoms.org. Um, it is very, very helpful. I don't know if I'll post it in the chat uh, in case anyone else can't see it. No, apparently I can't. Oh, well. Um, my first job for F1 is psych. Do you recommend any reading to do before it? Um, I would. So the best, there's the, this book, PRN Psychiatry, written by an amazing, hilarious psychiatrist um, who works in South London. Um, and that is widely regarded as a super helpful book for psychiatry in general. So PRN Psychiatry is probably my first recommendation, but I think kind of, I don't know, if you're interested, I think it can be really valuable reading things like The Shock of the Fall, which is a book about someone who experienced, who is, suffers with schizophrenia, or I know The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime is obviously all about autism. I don't know if your job is related to that at all. It might not be in CAMS at all, so it might not be relevant. Um, but those books that give you an insight into what it's like to have those conditions, I think are so valuable. And you'll get so much more from that than perhaps you would from just reading a textbook. Because to be honest, in psych you, and I will say this as a big advert for psych in general, you're very well supervised. 
you will be very well supported. This is true as an F1, it's true as a trainee, I'm at the moment, it's a really good specialty for not leaving their trainees floundering, you know, not saying that never ever happens, but, um, you know, I guess there's a recognition in psych that you come up against some quite difficult stuff sometimes, and therefore the whole of psych is very much geared to address that and make sure that people don't, you know, get horribly miserable due to what they're seeing every day and drop out and become really sad. Um, you will have weekly supervision with a consultant on psych. Um, you will have bailing groups, sort of reflective groups to talk with the other trainees about difficult cases. You have all sorts of stuff. You'll have loads of support and you'll have loads of chance to talk about things that are confusing. So I think go in there with an open mind and be prepared to learn lots of interesting stuff. I wouldn't be desperately worried about having to cram things, but if you can read anything that gives you an insight into what it's like to have some of these illnesses, that could be really valuable. Um, right. Um, cool. I think we have addressed all the questions. Anyone kind of with any desperate worries about a job in psych that they're approaching or if they're if you're interested in psych training uh, I cannot recommend it highly enough I'm having the best time um, please drop me an email I'm more than happy to uh, offer any further advice such as I have it so yeah um, that's all from me I will let um, the becoming a doctor team stop the chat when they're ready <laughs>